I always think it's important to know who's delivering information that you're listening to because who's delivering it, what their background is, what they know, what they don't know is always important to what they're telling you. I have a radically different background. I'm not a scientist. I am an attorney. I've owned and operated businesses. I am very trained in all different types of uh, psychic skills. You could sort of see from here, I'm trained in all different types of remote viewing, CRV, ARV, ERV. I've created a new type of remote viewing. I've been teaching this type that I call TSP for about close to seven years. I do psychokinesis. I've worked with some scientists for a few years on that. I also did training in Russia, which I will talk briefly about. Uh, I trained for about a decade as a psychic detective. I've worked with paranormal investigative groups all over the world. I've trained with the spiritualist church as a spiritual medium for a couple of years. Audio engineering, tossed that one in. And just all kinds of sort of other things. I've written, published five books, different topics. So that's sort of a crazy background. In terms of being psychic, I am just about 100% just trained. I'm like anybody else. And that has given me insights into how to share the reality of that and how to achieve it. These are um, my books. This is Psychic Intuition, which I explain psychic ability in terms of neuroscience, psychology, linguistics. A, I've written <laughs> a history of French porcelain. I'm working on, currently on a book on psychokinesis. I wrote, co-wrote the memoirs of a retired New York City homicide detective. And also I wrote a book, uh, Exolinguistics, which was the comparative linguistic analysis of so-called alien languages, spoken, written, and telepathic. A lot of you I know do watch uh, Jeff Mishlove's uh, show, New Thinking Aloud. He's been doing that for decades. I He's fantastic. And I, I've done many interviews with him. You know, these are some of the interviews, if any of you were interested in that at all. So my purpose here, I'm going to read this to you. I do not seek to scientifically objectively define or prove the true essence or source of consciousness. I am merely trying to help scientists become aware of the pitfalls of the scientific method used to investigate consciousness so we can accelerate our understanding. I'm proposing a psychosensory approach to enable scientists to access better information about the extent and powers of consciousness and its relationship to physical reality to foster less reliance on the currently, let's say, unassailable concept of so-called objective reality. Here's my disclaimer. I don't think anybody else has done a disclaimer for you. I've seen everybody citing everybody kind of uh, almost compulsively. And, you know, I did the most heavily documented law review article when I was in law school. I had 400 footnotes. I got uh, an award for best thesis prize when I was uh, in college. Everything I've done, particularly as an attorney, is heavily documented. However, I think there's a point where, particularly in this field, we know the quotes, we know what all the, the quantum physicist guys have said, and, and the classical physicists, and we, we all sort of know that. And I don't see any point in, in reviewing that again. And I think that if you want to advance a field or a concept, you sort of have to go beyond simply assembling the building blocks of the past. I mean, that's useful. It's good to know, but you have to go beyond that. My point here is uh, right here on the bottom. If this presents a problem that you will not learn the principles behind what I teach, I study life through experience and not through the eyes or language of others. Problem using the scientific method to capture consciousness. This is sort of what we consider physical reality, which is sort of ends up being considered what is reality. Physical reality can be described by these just basic principles, I think. Objective, measurable, permanent, repeatable, consistent. It obeys natural laws, operates on a consensus reality, which is our shared reality. It's sort of what we can all agree on which is, in my view, it's sort of the lowest common denominator of reality, but that's what we're stuck with, okay? And then most importantly, it does not interact with subjective reality. Pseudoscience versus, well, science versus pseudoscience. I have looked at this a bit. I mean, the, ter the term pseudoscience has become sort of a dirty word. It no longer refers to a phenomenon or phenomena that are simply excluded 
from scientific reality because they're unfalsifiable. That's what it used to be. Uh, today, thanks to what I would call growing scientific fascism, those who work on unusual or rare types of phenomena that cannot be easily proven by the scientific method are deemed to be heretics of true science. Thus, pseudoscience has been successfully branded now, almost like a propaganda, as the opposite of true science. It is now considered a fake science, the domain of fraud and charlatanism, and this creates a false conclusion that when a given phenomenon can't be proven using the scientific method, it's deemed not to be a part of any physical reality. So the entire concept of pseudoscience has gotten twisted, which is something that I think needs to be corrected. I love this. I guess it applies to what I do here. Uh, I believe you, but you have to prove it first. Oh, yeah, and I won't let you prove it. There's a big problem with the scientific method in dealing with many of the aspects of consciousness and what I do. And I sort of, I, I got <laughs> talking about feeling compelled to write things in sort of legalistic terms. I, for whatever reason, this felt like almost a, a, a whereas clause in the middle of a contract. So a scientific assumptions, whereas one, mental activity is non-physical and thus not a physical force. And two, mental activity, such as thoughts and feelings, are limited to the domain of the individual mind, and three, mental activity does not interact with reality and thus cannot influence physical matter. Now, therefore, all claims of psychic skills must be fraudulent or false. That would be logical, right? But you got to make sure that all your, your whereas assumptions are correct. And I thought it was kind of important here to talk about, well, what really is a charlatan? Because people always talk about people who do psychic work as being charlatans or frauds or those who are engaging in some type, you know, parapsychologists engaging in some kind of so-called pseudoscience. Essentially, and, you know, I've, I've dealt with, uh, for example, the amazing Kreskin, who is a very famous mentalist, stage performer. He does amazing feats uh, that appear to be psychic. And he chose to sort of side with the mentalist magicians because people will buy into that. They think magicians are at least, they're not fraudulent because they confess that when they do stuff that looks psychic, it really isn't. In fact, the amazing Kreskin told me. He is psychic, and the stuff, he, much of what he's doing, yes, he's trained in hypnosis, much of things, but much of what he is doing is truly psychic. By the same token, a psychic is not a charlatan. A psychic produces true psychic acts that resemble magic that people believe can't possibly be real, but the psychic confesses to be real. The only person who's a true charlatan would be a psychic who acts as a magician to produce fake psychic acts based on magic tricks. Consciousness isn't just a left brain perception. Here's the scientific bootstrap. The problem with scientific method is that it rejects reality that doesn't conform to its unacknowledged preconceptions about what reality ought to be and how it ought to be studied. That's the bootstrap. That's why the scientific method is stuck there. As a result, science can only build a toy model of reality based on its own limited mode of thinking, even though it's highly functional. It is highly functional. It works, but it's, it's limited. The way that I sort of, in my mind, think of the scientific models is that they're kind of like scaffolding around a building. And if you're trying to do that to build a model of consciousness, you're just building it on this sort of exterior level. It can accurately reflect the overall exterior physical shape in classical and quantum terms, but it cannot model the mysterious interior of the structure and to date the elusive source of intuition. Intuition, as I understand it, they've been able to locate sources of intuition when it has to do with being able to move the physical body, but they have not been able to locate the source of intention when it comes to making the spark of the decisions. So this has always been my problem with the scientific method and doing any type of psychic work. This is um, a scientific method builds kind of a, a logical rat maze 
it's got to fulfill certain requirements and you have to be a certain type of a, a creature in order to run through this maze. And if you're not that type of a creature, the method isn't going to work for you. And I think that's the source of the problem with scientific method trying to attack the issue of consciousness. When uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the amazing Randy. He was a well-known, highly skeptical magician. He sort of outed a lot of fake psychics and, and stuff like that, but he sort of made a career out of it. He put up, a, it was a contest, a million dollars for anyone who would prove to him using his methods that psychic phenomena was real. And I remember thinking about it and thinking, well, that's pointless. If you're not his kind of a, a mouse or a lab rat, his uh, system was built for a very specific creature that he could judge and you'd never win. You just wouldn't win. Same goes with consciousness here, I think. Problem is consciousness, both subject and object. It's both the lens and the specimen of the scientific study. So how do we determine where the subject ends and when the object begins? Where's the line of demarcation? In fact, does it even exist? That's really ought to be the opening, I think, question of where we start. I think some of that has already sort of been addressed with the observer effect in quantum physics, which has talked about the relationship, you know, between observation, capturing particle versus a wave and that kind of thing. But I don't know. I've, I've looked at a lot of the experiments on this, and I don't know that they've fully resolved the issue of whether the object, namely the photon, or the, the light wave has been literally changed, or whether it's the relative position of the observer that has caused a different perspective to occur. I don't know that that's been fully resolved, even with some of the double slit experiments that they've done over different period, you know, time lapse. So you have the battle between the right and the left hemispheres, and I'm sure most of you are aware of that. So you had Roger Spiri's split brain studies where he showed that each hemisphere has essentially it's a different consciousness. And he, most importantly, I think, was showing that certain aspects of what we know to be our objective reality become literally imperceptible and therefore invisible, okay, to the percipient, unless they have the right hemispheric tools to be able to acknowledge that reality. So your left hemisphere, you know, logical linear and deals with what I would say would be extrapolation. And your right hemisphere is illogical, nonlinear, deals with insight. Clearly, this is going to be more your analytic, intellectual, scientific approach. Clearly, this is going to be more your psychic, creative, non-analytic thinker. The left hemisphere is dominant. I'm sure you all know that. So what happens is that the perceptions of the right hemisphere get suppressed and overruled by the left hemisphere continuously. The left hemisphere is going to be controlling primarily with words. And so those perceptions disappear out of our conscious existence. They're gone. Doesn't mean they don't exist. We don't perceive them. We're not consciously aware of them. Sort of an example of the battle for brain supremacy, logic versus sensory perception, which would be somewhat analogous to, you know, left brain, right brain, is this the Stroop effect. Probably saw these on mugs and things. And it's very difficult if you've got to read out the color of the word as opposed to the word itself. And what they've suggested is that one reason for that may be what they're calling speed of processing. In other words, it's easier for the brain to process words than sense of color. And again, sense of words, that puts you back into your left hemisphere, you know, linguistic stuff. So linguistic controls, analysis controls. It suppresses the other data that's available to us. There's that old joke about the fish. It's asked to describe its environment in its fishbowl, and it describes everything except the water in which it lives. And in my opinion, science fails to describe or reflect on its own mode of thinking. It seems to feel logical thought is universal and uniform. Right brain perceptions of reality have become invisible like water. Our methods to study consciousness reflect this type of limited consciousness. So few scientists are aware of how their own, I would say, unevaluated style of cognition and research and reliance on the scientific method 
which is somewhat like the water in the fishbowl, affects their understanding of everything else because they don't see it. It's not being evaluated. It's being suppressed by their mode of thought, which is highly left-brained. Any of the, the mode of thinking left-brained is, is going to be logical, linear, causal, cause and effect. That's key. Quantitative and linguistic. And again, if the object of research can't be described that way, it becomes literally perceptually non-existent and invisible. I would like to put out there the way that we think governs what we will perceive. And what we perceive governs our notions of what constitutes reality. Therefore, you change your mode of thinking to expand your captured perceptions that will enlarge your knowledge of reality. And I mean knowledge. You will know more. So expanded consciousness reveals a mental link to physical reality. Expanded consciousness reveals the, what I would call the quote unquote impossible. I didn't think any of this stuff was possible until I started exploring these things a few decades ago. But I've absolutely been able to to show to my satisfaction over and over and over and over again, psychic access to information defies our concept of linear time and psychokinetic work defies our concept of non-interactive physical reality. And those are kind of violating two basic precepts of the scientific method. In my opinion, psychic skills reveal subjective reality is inseparable from objective reality. They're part of the same phenomenon. They influence each other. I don't see them as separate. My opinion, anyway, is that physical reality is an experiential subset of consciousness. And there are many, many different ways to rearrange that subset. You guys probably know all about the homunculus. Uh, which was developed uh, way back as 16th century by uh, Paracelsus, I think, but then got sort of redeveloped and and Penfield put it into the cortical uh, homunculus, which sort of reflects our, it's it's a cartoon version uh, based on how much of our cortical brain that uh, is involved in sensory experience, if, if you could show it proportionately, what it would look like. And what I'm suggesting to you is it really we need a new homunculus? We need one that shows expanded consciousness, and it would look more like this. It would not look like this. This is highly limited, and I think this is outdated. It may seem strange or even impossible, but psychics and intellectuals literally perceive and experience physical reality differently. And as a result, psychics can manipulate physical reality in time and space, whereas analytic thinkers or intellectuals cannot. And I was never able to do that. I never believed that it was possible because I couldn't do it. I didn't know anybody who could. I'd never seen it done. Therefore, I believed it had to be impossible. And I have now proven myself wrong. So ways to enhance perception, to create new meanings. So now I'm going to suggest access, access points in order to understand what I'm talking about. Science in general, scientists in general, kind of dismiss imagination. It's unreal. It's, you know, private, personal. It has nothing to do with reality. However, I think that that fails to take into account that both logical thought and what we call imagination, which most people feel is not grounded in physical reality or logic, are both born from the same process of collecting and connecting a set of data points using psychosensory perception. This is a a process called apophenia. It's the psychological tendency to make meaningful patterns from random things, to perceive things that aren't actually there, such as this guy's face. Apophenia is it's not a a bad thing. It can range anywhere from acute psychosis to genius creativity. It's just literally seeing meaningful patterns. Meaningful, again, is key, kind of like Jung's definition of a meaningful coincidence to create a synchronicity. Pareidolia is sort of the product of apophenia. It's sort of this illusion that something could be different. It could be perceived differently from what it actually is. 
And by the way, when you're a baby and you have no experience with reality, that's all you're doing is you're engaging in this sort of apophenia of you creating patterns, meaningful patterns of reality for the first time in your life ever. And that is a type of experiential exploration of sensory data that without preconception or without prior analysis, that is what psychics are doing. This I sort of use to kind of give a general idea of how you move from your five senses, okay, which is just the lowest common denominator of shared realities, consensus reality, your five senses, and moving out into sort of a psychic understanding of the world. There are people who have enhanced five sense abilities, such as, let's say, tetrachromats. They could see a million more colors than your average uh, trichromatic person with three cones. They can, they can hear, sound, uh, taste, touch much larger versions of reality than your average person here. Okay. After that, I would say it sort of leads you into the arena of synesthesia, where you have crossover between your five senses. And there's a direct language translation from one sense into the other. So you may taste a shape, you may hear a color, you know, any, any of those things. And that sort of gets you slightly into this realm of what might begin to feel like, let's call it maybe imagination, but it's not. And from there, that takes you into what I'm calling psychic sensing. I would say psychic magic, so-called magic, is nothing more than a person's psychosensory ability to perceive and connect seemingly unrelated dots. This is what we're looking at all the time. And I would say by way of analogy, if you look at some of the colorblind tests, you know, you've got three different types of colorblind here, okay? Can't see red light. And essentially, these people can't distinguish between the dots. They, they can't see them. This is what your average person is going to be seeing. They'll see the, the number two. And then it will be seen differently with these two other types of colorblindness. It's a way of seeing or not seeing the dots that create reality. This is this famous painting. It's pointillism. It was developed uh, mostly by Seurat and his contemporaries. So you're seeing only dots of light. This is how I see the world. I thought it was normal. Uh, apparently it's not. I can see what I believe are individual photons of light all the time. Nothing appears as solid matter. Everything shimmers like little itty bitty shimmering, colorful dots of light. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's daytime or nighttime. And in fact, it's not impossible. The human eye can see a single photon. The retina can register it, but it's our neural filters that will block it until minimally we see five to nine photons in roughly 100 milliseconds. So I think the clue here to seeing differently, you tap into this sort of subconscious mind to achieve a, what a conscious awareness of sight. When I've done blind sight and glaucoma tests, I've scored rather high on both, but in terms of the glaucoma, or actually both of them, I seem to be credited with seeing things that I cannot see with my eyes, but I correctly identify them on these tests. So that's sort of the difference where between your conscious awareness of what you're actually visually seeing versus what you somehow realize subconsciously that you can see, but you don't see it with your physical eyes. This is a, a little thing I, I put together. So this is sort of, let's call this reality. And it's sort of a, reality is a hot mess. But if you look at it a particular way, I got rid of the noise, okay, which are the orange dots there, now it becomes somewhat clearer. And then you have choices. You have a choice in this, let's say this is your reality. You have a choice. You can connect the dots and see it this way. You can connect these dots and see it this way. And what I'm suggesting to you is that in order to enhance, let's call it your psychic ability, all you're doing is connecting dots differently. You're seeing the same dots as everybody else. There's nothing magical or different. This is all part of our, let's say, physical reality. You've just connected it differently. Same thing goes with synchronicities. I've had many, many synchronicities as part of some of the, the uh, work that I do with remote viewing. And as I said, you know, it's sort of this 
uh, as Jung called them, you know, a causal intersection of events or meaningful coincidences. But these are all part of the same reality in different, let's say, potential space-time locations. And when they begin to connect or happen simultaneously, that's when we pay attention. And again, we're just connecting the dots differently than we might otherwise. So I'd say creation of meaning involves, at least as far as I can see, three different things. The first thing is focusing. You're using attention and intention. So it's a psychosensory mix. You are relating a group of a matrix of dots, let's say photons or sensory data points, that you somehow perceive to be related without any underlying logic or assumption. That's how you create a meaning. And then you're solidifying them. They congeal to embody this new object or scenario. All I've been talking about here is, is making the what's invisible to most of us to making it visible, to making it real. Psychic sensing exists in this weird, uncomfortable zone of unknown objects that manifest a sort of part sensory experience and part mental imagination. There are no pre-existing words to describe these experiences. That's what makes it so difficult to access. And the left hemisphere has a big problem with that. And science in general has a big problem because identity matching of the elements is extremely difficult. So I wanted to give you an idea for those of you who don't already know, how does a psychic experience a psychic event? This was something I did. I was doing platform mediumship a long time ago. And when you do that, you stand up in front of a group, you connect with spirit, and then you start delivering information from the spirit that will be only attributable to one person who's sitting in that little audience. And they will identify who that spirit is. And usually you, you identify it by relationship to the person, physical description, maybe age when they passed, gender, some other stuff. And then you have to give additional information. I had done all that. I'd found the person and I was having a real problem. I had to deliver more evidence because this is called evidentiary mediumship that I had got the right spirit. And I shut my eyes and all I could see was the inside of my eyelids, which wasn't very interesting. It was sort of gray and shadows and kind of boring. And it wasn't making any sense because in this realm, nothing makes sense. And you cannot force it to make sense. You can't reverse engineer any of this stuff. And so I'm looking at the inside of my eyelids and I'm thinking, this is terrible. Finally, something vaguely, vaguely transforms into sort of a grayish, what appears to be sort of a hand. But it's not like a normal hand because it has these long sort of smoky tendrils coming off of the, the fingertips. And I think, well, that's just bizarre. I said to the person, the sitter, they call it, I said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't know what this is. And clearly it doesn't make any sense. And I'm so sorry. It's really silly. And I gave this image and uh, she laughed. She said, no, the spirit, the, the person you've connected with, my relative in life was a finger puppeteer. So could I have described this as a Somebody who's a finger puppeteer? No. I didn't know. I didn't have words for this. But if I could describe it, she understood it completely. And that's very often how this stuff works. You can't force this process. It's not a thought process. It's strictly sensory. And a lot of people don't understand that. And by the way, the vision will shape itself. You cannot shape the vision. And you have got to trust that your brain the part of your brain that understands things that are invisible will somehow come up with something that will have a direct relationship with physical reality. And then at a certain point, you do engage in a certain amount of thought, I would say, through free association, but not logical thinking to try and interpret. What I do in my teaching of my TSP remote viewing is I try to teach my students how to become what I call mentally ambidextrous. So they got to flip back and forth between sensory experience and then certain types of free association or analysis. Uh, now I'm going to take you into my world. It turns out psychic, paranormal, and ufological realms are all connected. 
They all implicate related skills, states of expanded consciousness, unusual sensory perceptions, and manipulations of physical reality in terms of space and time. These are my psychic skills and experience. And, you know, you could feel free to ask me about anything. 